and how I miss that sound. For 90 years, that mournful boat whistle from 1892 to 1983 was the economic and cultural heartbeat for Frankfurt and Alberta. Nothing much here now to indicate the importance, just ghosts. But not so long ago, within living memory of those of us of a certain age, this spot where I'm standing was the busiest, noisiest rail yard in existence. 24 hours a day, trains coming and going, boats loading, unloading rail cars under the glare of lights at night, 365 days a year. You've probably heard the story about how this pioneering and unique industry came to be here on Betsy Bay. I'm not going to go deeply into that, but rather try to show how all-encompassing the car ferry and railroad operation was for every citizen of these towns. Suffice to say, moving loaded freight cars across Lake Michigan was the brainchild of one James Ashley, friend of Lincoln, abolitionist, senator, and railroad man. There was no proof it could be done, but he was confident enough to order two specially designed ships to be built even as the railroad construction was proceeding from Toledo to Betsy Bay. The maiden voyage across to Kewanee, Wisconsin came in November 1892, and it was successful. Eventually there were eight ships built, four or five in service during busy periods. A majority of the immigrants to the area were Norwegian because of the commercial fishing industry, and this population provided much of the manpower for the fleet. In fact, the car ferry fleet was jokingly called the Norwegian Navy and the ubiquitous seagulls, Norwegian chickens. A long line of Norwegian captains with names like Larsen, Hansen, Fredriksen, and Eriksen served from beginning to end of the operation. Captains and chief engineers were prominent and revered citizens of the community, on par with bankers, doctors, and business owners. The sailing schedules were such that the men were away from home much of the time, leaving the household decisions and raising of children to the wives. Many of the crewmen were young single men, some with roots in the area, some not. Many came from the Wisconsin side of the fleet, so often the crewmen from Frankfurt and those from Kewanee or Manitowoc would trade work schedules so each could be off watch when the boat was docked on their home side. Some of the buildings on Main Street in Frankfurt had rooms for rent on the second floor. Two or three sailors would sometimes go in together and rent one room since their sailing schedules meant they would never be in port at the same time. Each boat would have a crew of 40 to 50 men, also a few ladies as cooks or cabin maids. Normally there would be about eight officers, a captain and first, second, third mates, a chief engineer and a couple of assistants, and the purser. As the boats were converted gradually from coal burning to diesel oil, crews were decreased by approximately eight coal handlers. When we include the marine terminal workers, radio men, and other land-based employees, the workforce required was nearly 500. This made the Ann Arbor car ferries by far the major employer of Frankfurt and Alberta. In good weather, most boats could do two round trips every 24 hours if the rail traffic called for it. Weather prediction was the key element of the operation and in the early days was mostly a gut feeling on the part of the captains, who became more skilled with time. The final decision on whether to sail or not was the captains. 
and it became well known who was more cautious and who was more likely to cross in questionable conditions. If a smooth crossing was anticipated, only minimal securing of the rail cars was necessary and could be accomplished by the four car handler crewmen. But in bad weather, maximum securing using blocks, jacks, turnbuckles, and straps would be necessary for all 25 or so cars carried on a full load, and the whole ship's crew would pitch in. Turnaround time in port was usually about two hours to offload cars and onload for the return trip. During this time, those crew members not on watch could leave the boat for a quick trip home to see the family or grab a drink or two with a meal at one of the local watering holes. The ship's whistle would sound a signal one half hour before sailing to alert the crew to get back to the ship. Usually the deck officer on duty would also call the bars and an announcement would be made to the patrons. There were at least two taxi services in Frankfurt specializing in these trips, and in the early years the men could take the Bell Ferry across Betsy Bay. The work schedules evolved through the years. In the beginning, the men were simply worked as long as they would tolerate before they left the boat for other opportunities. There was no designated vacation time. Many of the men without families simply lived on the boat, taking short runs into town only during the port loading. As the unions became more established after 1940, the standard was 20 days on and 8 days off. This allowed officers and crew to actually take family vacations. Of course, as the union movement became stronger, this meant periodic work stoppages or strikes, either by the railroad workers, meaning no traffic to transport, or the seafarers' unions themselves, usually over better pay and hours. If a strike was prolonged, money could become tight for Frankfurt, Alberta families. Barbara Erickson Johnson remembers eating perch for dinner seven weeks in a row because they were plentiful and free. As with any town dominated by a single industry, there were benefits and drawbacks. Chief among the former was the pay. The standard of living for an officer and his family was quite high considering most were without extensive formal education. Even the ordinary crewmen were compensated at a much higher level than most citizens of northern Michigan. This was especially true during the years of the Great Depression when full employment was the rule. The downside could be summed up by two points. First, since the boats ran on a 24-hour schedule, meaningful time off with family was unpredictable. Secondly, there was a unique problem with coal smoke. When getting up steam to leave port, the fires would be stoked to the maximum, resulting in a spewing forth from the smokestacks and an obnoxious stew of black smoke and coal ash. Depending on the wind direction, this would rain down on Frankfurt or Alberta, coating everything in sight. Not a good time to hang out the laundry. This dispute between the Ann Arbor and the city came to a head in 1951 when P.C. McNulty brought his fine yacht into Betsy Bay for overnight anchorage and found it covered in coal dust the next morning. He wrote a letter to the mayor of Frankfurt stating that the harbor was a fine one for cruising boaters, but the suit problem was a real drawback. Since he was the Commodore of the Great Lakes Cruising Club, this got the attention of the city council, who demanded a meeting with representatives of the Ann Arbor. They realized it was a problem and were conciliatory, leading to the installation of smoke abatement systems on all the boats. There were several favorite drinking establishments for the officers and crews in their time away from the ship. One of them was here in Alberta, which you probably know as the Mayfair. But during the Ann Arbor days, it was more commonly known as pea soups. Not sure why. Maybe they made great pea soup to go with your beer. It was owned and run through most of its existence by various generations of the Luxford family. In Frankfurt, there was the Villa Marine, 
the Seven Spot, now the Storm Cloud Brewery, and Baker's Bar, now called Dingy's, conveniently right next door to the Union Hall. Because the crewmen were off the ship at any hour of the day, the bars were ready to serve drinks or cook breakfast around the clock. I don't know if it's true, but I was told the wives of the crewmen like to have their afternoon gatherings at the Villa Marine with its great view of the harbor so they could see when their husband's boat came in and rush home to get at the housework. On the Wisconsin side, the Foam Tavern in Manitowoc was the favored bar. Whenever veteran sailors gathered over a drink or two, many of the stories traded were about ice and storms. Ice was a constant nemesis to keeping to a schedule. From the very first, it was determined that to make a profit, the boats must transport rail cars year-round. This had never been tried on the upper Great Lakes. The ships were designed with rounded and reinforced hulls to ride up on top of the ice and break it with the weight of the ship. This made for slow progress and didn't always work, in which case the boat could be locked in place for hours or days until another boat could arrive and break her out. Sometimes the crew would go over the side with ice spuds to attempt release. Occasionally, two or three boats would all be frozen in together in a heavy ice field. Since the ice windrows were thickest near shore, a stranded ship would usually be within two to three miles of shore, meaning parties of men with sleds could walk to town and get supplies and mail while waiting to break free. This picture from the early 1900s shows the wives and children walking out to the ship on a Sunday afternoon to see the site and chat with the crew. Sometimes these ice tourists got in the way, as in this picture of a Model T parked directly in the path of Captain Tullidge as he was trying to keep up momentum to break the ice. A stern letter was written. He was not happy. Gales and blizzards were the most worrisome events for the captains, crews, and the families waiting for news on shore. Before 1915, there was no radio communication with the boats, and it was anybody's guess if the ship was fighting the waves mid-lake, still in port on the other side, or taking shelter in South Manitou Island Harbor. Weather was unpredictable and many a crossing started out in a gentle sea only to quickly turn into a nightmare trip partway across. It was the captain's decision whether to forge ahead or try to turn the boat around. There were several instances of rail cars breaking loose and causing great damage to the ship's interior. The telephone support network among the wives back in Frankfurt as they tried to get any news from the marine terminal in Alberta, was extremely busy during these storms. Miraculously, despite several close calls through the years, not one life was lost at sea during the 90 years of operation. After World War II, as the rail traffic steadily diminished, the Ann Arbor ferries turned to carrying more automobiles and passengers. Summer residents in this area often used this route coming and going from their homes in Illinois, and Wisconsin, and other Midwestern states. But it just wasn't enough. When Captain Bruce Jewell brought the Viking into port from Kewanee in April 1982, few realized it would be the last crossing. The company was just losing too much money. The uh, railroad was dissolved and absorbed into other uh, railroads. The ships were sold off and the officers and crew either found other work or remained on the Great Lakes on other vessels. The rail yard and terminal were abandoned and left to decay what you see now in front of you as a village park. Frankfurt and Alberta were left to reinvent themselves as tourist economies. Yes, 
it's all gone now. But oh, what I wouldn't give to go back in time for one day in 1892 and take that trip across the lake with James Ashley on the Ann Arbor number one. I hope you've enjoyed this look into our past. I'm indebted to Grant Brown for his book, 90 Years of Crossing Lake Michigan, from which I gained much of this material. If you'd like to look deeper into the subject, I highly recommend his book. It's for sale, of course, at the Benzie Area Historical Museum. Until we meet again for another look into the wonderful history of our Benzie home, stay safe, and remember, history matters.